I hate the defendant. With every bone in my body and every drop of blood in my veins, I hate Caitlin Ann Conley because Caitlin Ann Conley murdered my mother. Adam was standing there and I think the cigarette almost fell out of his mouth. He was definitely surprised. He didn't expect us to go out there and find anything in his vehicle. With all due respect to the justice system and to our jury system, This is Caitlin Conley. In 2015, she killed her ex's mother and tried to frame him for her murder. What drove Caitlin to this shocking decision? And what were all the steps leading to poor Mary Yoder's untimely death? This is the full story of Caitlin Conley and how she destroyed the Yoder family. July 21st, 2015 was another normal day at the office for Mary Yoder. She and her husband, Bill, had a chiropractor's clinic in the state of New York. They'd been running it for three decades and it was a successful and fulfilling career for them. Mary and Bill, they build up this chiropractic business and they turn it really into a family business that everybody in Utica really looks to as, this is the place to go. After having breakfast, Mary saw her first patient at around 8 a.m. On that day, she'd planned to go have lunch with her mother. However, when she got to her mother's house, her mother had already eaten. So after visiting her mother, Mary went back to the clinic and had a protein shake for lunch. In the evening, she was supposed to return home and have dinner with Bill. But before she made it home, she called Bill. By the end of that day, she's calling her husband, Bill, saying, don't get dinner ready for me because I feel horrible right now. I'm not going to be eating. That was concerning for Bill. Mary was never sick. Everyone who knew her knew how healthy she was. In fact, staying healthy and encouraging other people to do the same was her mantra. She even grew herbs in her own garden and was an avid holistic medicine consumer. My sister was very health conscious, okay? And she sold these supplements and stuff. I mean, she lived on supplements. Mary left work early and came home. Her vomiting and diarrhea only got worse, and she had no idea where she could have gotten such an illness. But she didn't panic. She just tried to stay hydrated and go to bed early. Mary figured, like many stomach illnesses, she could just sleep it off. However, Bill was shocked when he saw her that morning. When she woke up, Mary looked half dead. And he says immediately, I put her in the car we head off to the emergency room. St. Luke's Hospital ran several tests on Mary, but they couldn't figure out her illness either. It wasn't the flu or any of the common stomach bugs going around. In the late evening, Mary started having cardiac arrests. The medics resuscitated her with a defibrillator several times, but it was too late to save her. On July 23rd, 36 hours after becoming sick, Mary passed away at the hospital. All of her family was there, Bill, her three children, and Caitlin Conley, her office manager, and her son's on and off girlfriend. Mary's death was heartbreaking. She had dedicated her whole life to staying healthy and helping others love their bodies. Now she'd suffered a violent death and died scared and confused, not knowing what was happening or why. Her family was devastated. They had no chance to say goodbye, and they were confident Mary's life was in safe hands at the hospital. But they had no idea what caused Mary's death. The doctors couldn't determine a cause of death either. However, they did realize it was a very unusual situation, so they suggested to Bill that they do an autopsy on Mary. And Bill says right away, absolutely. I want to know what's going on here. As the coroner started his autopsy, he noticed something very strange. As he's looking under slides of cells from her individual organs, the cells appear like they are killing themselves. That was a major clue. It meant Mary might have been poisoned. So Dr. Clark initially orders blood tests on certain heavy metals and the typical poisons like an arsenic, cyanides and they all come back negative. As the coroner was still trying to figure out how Mary had died, her body was released back to the family and cremated. At this point, he only had one vial of blood left, one last shot at determining her cause of death. He reaches out for upstate poison control and Dr. Gina Marafa, and based upon the timetable of events of when Mary becomes symptomatic to the time of death, along with the cardiac events she is leaning on 
that is a typical colchicine poisoning. Colchicine is a medicine normally used in very low doses to treat gout. In higher doses, it can indeed be fatal. Colchicine toxicity causes fever, abdominal cramping, vomiting, basically all of your liquids leave your body. So Dr. Clark sent his last vial of blood for cloclean testing. Two months after Mary's death, the test came out positive. They had a cause of death. This had to be shocking. It was very shocking. Imagine learning your loved one has been poisoned to death. Who would want them dead? Did they have any enemies that you didn't know of? We couldn't believe our sister had died of colchicine poisoning. Her love of life and staying healthy meant Mary was not the type to take her own life. But no one could think of someone who would want her dead either. So at first, the police were considering an accident. She has a garden and possibly had taken something from the garden. She also takes supplements. So they're also looking at some contamination in the supplements. They had those collected and sent out for tests. But no contamination came up and her garden seemed pristine. As the police scratched out all other possible theories, only one remained. Mary was murdered. The Oneida County Examiner's Office ruled her death as a homicide, so the investigation could officially begin. No one could think of any enemies that would want Mary dead, but in any homicide investigation, the police start with the immediate family. Anytime somebody dies, the, the spouse is, you know, somebody that's looked at usually very hard and for good reason, oftentimes, they're, you know, they're responsible for it. Another thing made Bill look suspicious. He usually worked with Mary at the chiropractor's clinic every day, but on July 22nd, he was out of office. Conveniently, the detectives thought. The detective's suspicions was even obvious to Mary's other relatives who were interrogated. I got the impression they thought Bill did it. And they asked me flat out, did I think he did it at that point in time? I said no, because in all fairness to another human being, I have no reason to think he did that. However, Janine did add that if Bill was involved with another woman, he might have had the motivation to murder his wife. And allegedly, Bill did have an affair with Mary and Janine's sister. There was nail after nail in the cross for Bill. Do you think Bill's relationship with Kathy began before Mary died? Yes, I do. Strangely, Bill and Kathy are still an item now, but both of them say that they became involved two months after Mary's death. Whichever the case, this wasn't helping Bill in the investigation. Something else that wasn't helping was that he seemed uninterested in the investigation. He began taking frequent trips out of town, almost as if he was trying to escape what was going on back home. Of course, people handle grief in different ways, and perhaps Bill really wanted to escape the horrible feelings of loss and shock he had when he was at home. But the police didn't know this. What they saw was a suspicious character. You know, he didn't seem to be, you know, anybody that saw him Agreed said, widow. yeah, he just didn't seem to be. Perhaps Bill would have been arrested soon if it wasn't for a mysterious anonymous letter received by the sheriff's office. On November 23rd, 2016, four months after Mary's death, two letters showed up. One at the medical examiner's office, the other at the Oneida County Sheriff. The letter directs us to one person and one person only, and that's Adam Yoder, Mary Yoder's youngest son. The letter clearly stated Adam Yoder is responsible. This wasn't just a theory, it sounded like facts. The letter even stated the name of the poison and pointed out that the police will find the bottles in Adam's truck. He said now the colchicine container is under the front passenger side of his Jeep. That's where he said it was until he figures out where to dispose of it next. The homicide investigation quickly turned toward Adam, leaving Bill alone. The police rang Adam and invited him for another round of questioning. Adam turned up in his Jeep, the one mentioned in the letter. During the interrogation, it became clear Adam was very close to his mom. They both loved each other deeply and shared lots of activities together, even as he became an adult. A few hours into the interview, the investigators told Adam about the letter and requested that they search his car. Adam is smoking a cigarette watching, and all of a sudden, Investigator Simmons pulls out the bottle of colchicine. Adam was standing there, and I think the cigarette almost fell out of his mouth. He was definitely surprised. He didn't expect us to go out there and find anything in his vehicle. The cold clean bottle was exactly where the letter said it would be, wrapped in a cardboard wrapper next to a receipt. This could send Adam to prison, or it could prove his innocence. 
the receipt contained a lot of personal information about Adam Yoder and the address that it was shipped to, the chiropractic family office his parents own. But apart from the address was Adam's email address, M-R-A-D-A-M-Y-O-D-E-R-1990 at gmail.com. However, when Adam saw the receipt, he said that was not his email address. It was pretty easy to prove that too. Anyone has their email address on the mail app on their phone these days. We then go back into the interview room and continue asking him questions. Adam was not even in town when his mom got sick. We had subpoenaed his easy pass prior to that. And when he gives us his explanation of where he was, it's the exact same as what the easy pass identifies. So long story short, Adam's story checked out. He had no motivation to kill his mother. He he wasn't in town, and the cold clean bottle was bought from an address that didn't belong to him, but had his name on it. That showed a new layer to the case, that someone wanted revenge on Adam, not on Mary. When the police asked Adam who would want to harm his mom or frame him, he couldn't think of anyone. He was adamant his father would never kill Mary or think of putting him in harm's way. Anyone else, the detectives asked? but Adam really didn't have a clue. Meanwhile, the police also interviewed Adam's on and off girlfriend, Caitlin. The initial intention was to gather more information about Adam from those who knew him intimately. They did not expect her to turn from a witness to a murder suspect. When Mary Yoder died, Katie was identified as a loved one in her obituary. Caitlin was a loved one and the front desk at the chiropractic clinic for years. After Mary died, she wrote a long post for her. If love could have saved you, you would have lived forever. And ends with this thought, God has gained the best angel. We love you. You guys, if I didn't know what Caitlin did, I would have said this is one of the most heartfelt eulogies I've ever read. So the police were hoping Katie was close enough to Adam to know if he would have wanted his mother dead. We were hoping she would provide some, she was going to be a witness and provide us some information if there was anything that she knew about. Caitlin blatantly told the cops Adam admitted to poisoning his mother. Adam told you that he, he did this to his mother? Right. And where he put the culture scene? Right. And he told you all this. Now why would he tell anybody on this what he did? Why would he come? You did something to somebody, way. Right, and I think it's like a power thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a control thing. It's another thing that keeps me... So he's going to tell you he did something like this and then control you from saying anything? Or, or what? He's going to use that power against you? Yeah, like, what can I say? As you can see, the detective was pretty suspicious of Katie. Why would he simply confide in her about killing his mom? Katie also confessed to having a toxic, turbulent relationship with Adam, complaining about him to the detectives. She talks about how you can't protect me and how she's scared of Adam, and that's specific to what the letter mentions. Days after interviewing Katie, the police received results from the lab after sending the anonymous letter in. It had female DNA on it underneath the stamp. So the police invited Katie for a second interview. They required her to provide a DNA sample. The detective had something else to ask her. And at that point, I asked her, if she's the author of the anonymous letter. When she didn't give me a no as an answer, that's an automatic flag for an investigator to ask the question again. The detective pressed her for an answer and Katie said yes. And then she went from a witness to all the way to a suspect. And remember how I said anyone has their email address set up on their phone? Caitlin had Mr. Adam Yoder 1990 set up on hers. And when they subpoenaed Google for more information about the address, it turns out the address was only accessed from Caitlin's home and her phone. Adam has no control over this phone, only you do. So we know you went in and you logged into that, that account. There's no way, there's no other physical way. You had to enter a password, you had to log into it. Katie stayed quiet and insisted wherever she could that Adam was the one responsible. But there was one last piece of evidence against her. The final piece of evidence is the DNA on the cardboard wrapper around the culture scene bottle comes back to Caitlin Conley, nobody else. Caitlin was thus arrested and charged with the murder of Mary Yoder, but the detectives still had to figure out why she did it. The only question we have left is why. <laughs> My life is over. 
<laughs> I don't know you guys, but one of the things that disgusts me the most in interrogations is when the murderer pities themselves for losing their freedom. No remorse for killing an innocent person, just regret for getting caught. Your life's not over, Katie. You're young. Your life is not over. You just need to know why. What drove you to this? <laughs> what drove you to do this, Katie? Was it Adam? I got a job. I got a job forever. Wow. Katie simply wouldn't share a motive. She kept crying about going to prison. Katie's trial in Utica attracted hundreds of people. News of Mary's death by poisoning sent shock waves through New York. Everyone wanted to know the full details of it. Why was Katie so angry with Mary? Was this just a way to get back at Adam? Get back at him for what? Had he even done something bad to her? And I'm telling you right here and now that this case entirely about the Shockingly, Katie's defense attorney pointed his finger at Bill, digging up all the suspicions the police had about him shortly after Mary's death. Poor Bill and his family just sat there speechless, listening to the false accusations. The defense said Bill had laced Mary's protein shake and left the office just in time to have an alibi. The defense team also made it clear Bill was having an affair with Mary's sister before her death. We found out that there were several witnesses that placed Kathy and Bill together prior to um, Mary's passing, including her neighbor. The prosecution had to show how Bill's affair had nothing to do with Mary's passing. Caitlin was a woman scorned. She wanted to try to get back at Adam by killing his mother. What did Adam do? Simple, he broke up with Caitlin. But the trial wasn't an easy one. Perhaps the most surprising side of all of it was Mary's own family being divided on Katie's conviction. Janine and Kathy, Mary's sisters, both thought Katie was being framed. Do you believe Caitlin Conley is responsible for your sister's death? No. Not at all. After three weeks of testimony and five days of deliberation, the jurors were deadlocked. The judge declared a mistrial. Five months after her mistrial, Katie returned for her second trial. This time, Katie's family hired a new defense attorney. Mary Yoder died from cold poison. That's true. And that's the only thing that will be proven in this case. But Katie's new attorney moved away from blaming Bill, instead pointing his finger at Adam. He painted the picture of a toxic, abusive relationship where Adam was mistreating Katie repeatedly. Adam's nephew, David, lived with Adam during the time, and he testified about the relationship. You think Katie was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Adam? Allegedly. And I do. The defense also said Adam was the vengeful type, not Katie, and that he was capable of framing Katie for Mary's murder. Something else came forward during the second trial. At one point in their relationship, Katie had gotten pregnant with Adam's baby and decided to have an abortion. When Adam found out, he was really upset. Adam, I'm so being torn up and hurt and confused now. Caitlin, I didn't want to do that alone and you didn't want to be there. Adam, you wouldn't have been alone. I'm not a piece of sh That decision should have been made by two people either way. The trial got pretty confusing. Both the prosecution and the defense were using the same evidence as proof that one framed the other for revenge. It worked both ways if you looked at it that way, but the prosecution suggested adding the charge of first degree manslaughter for Katie if found innocent. Toward the end of the trial, jurors analyzed Katie's interrogations one more time. One bit stood out. The detective asked Katie why Adam would keep the Coke clean bottle in his car, knowing that it could be searched. Remember, he had the bottle in his Jeep a whole five months after his mother's death. <laughs> Was she going for reverse psychology or was this a simple Freudian slip? Either way, the jurors simply didn't buy that Adam could have killed his mother. Plus, there was so much evidence against Katie, it was hard to ignore. The cell phone, the computers, 
and, and all those things that were forensically examined, those are what the prosecution really relies on and says that realistically, reasonably, who else would have been using these devices? Katie Googled the poison, wrote the letter, and touched the bottle. Still, the defense insisted it was just circumstantial evidence. The prosecution couldn't prove that Katie dropped the cold clean into the protein shake. Finally, it was time for Adam to make his victim impact statement. I introduced Katie Conley to my family. And because I loved her, and they all accepted her and treated her as family, as blood. Katie also had something to say. With all due respect to the justice system and to our jury system, I'm innocent. Sure, no guilt, no apology, just more crying for herself. Judge Michael Dwyer reminded Katie of the living hell Mary went through on her last two days. The thing that stands out in my mind most of all is those last two days of Mary Yoder's life. She went through agony over and over until the end. Katie Conley was sentenced to 23 years in prison. She could be released while still in her mid 40s. Caitlin continues to insist on her innocence so it's unlikely the Yoder family will ever get an apology. You can't apologize if you're adamant you didn't do it. This makes Mary's death all the more heartbreaking. And what's truly tragic is that Katie was punishing someone else. Why did Mary have to die for a mistake her son made? Or worse, for the way that Katie perceived him to be. We might never know the full extent of their turbulent relationship or Adam's alleged but there's always breaking up and moving on. No one deserves to die for it, especially not an innocent person in your ex's family. Katie will have over two decades to sit and think about what she did. Let's just hope she will move on from the self-pity to actual remorse and taking responsibility. Thanks for watching, you guys. What are your thoughts on this case? Do you know of other poisoning cases? Let me know down in the comment section. And before you leave, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time and stay safe.